merciful God. This one I've entitled, The Types and Shadows Concerning Mercy, and it might be added some examples to go along with it as well. But this, um, well, remember that um, when Moses went up the mount, the second time now, he went up the mount, and he asked the Lord to show me your glory. This is what he told him. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and the fourth generation. This is our God. This is the one we're waiting for. He's going to show up one of these days and He's going to deliver us. He's going to do it. He told us He's going to do it. See, you can trust in a God that does what He says He's going to do. Amen. He's told us He's merciful. Amen. Why? Now, we need mercy. Now, see, we're, we are of the few creatures in the whole creation that actually need mercy. The angels, remember the angels? They don't need mercy. They, the, the elect angels, the holy angels, the angels that stand in the presence of God, they don't require mercy, and yet... We're learning from this text, they desire to look into these things. See, they, they, they can't understand mercy in the same way we do. They have to see mercy demonstrated. And this is exactly what God's doing in Christ Jesus. He's demonstrating that he's, His character, it's an abundant character. He's a large God. His, we, we haven't even plumbed even the skirts of the garment. He just revealed a portion of who He is. As he's getting us ready for the ages to come when he's going to start divulging. He's going to have a people that can understand when he says something. Now remember now from the foot of the mountain, the casual observer from the foot of Mount Sinai looking up would have never guessed that he was a merciful God. That is not, that is not the impression you get from the bottom of the mountain. You, Moses himself said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Why? Because that's not what you saw from the bottom. That isn't what you get from the outside. You get, repent! This is what you get from the outside. God's got to get you in a position where he can divulge these good things. Until then, oh, you don't have this view of God. Amen. This is not the view of God you get from the bottom of the mountain. If anyone's ever going to learn of these higher aspects of the nature of God, they're going to have to get to the top of the mountain. You're going to have to be brought up higher. And to get up higher. Now, if you can do it, you can do it. He's made it all things, all things are possible with God. You just, what do you got to do? You just going to repent. You got to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And in due time, what will he do? He'll exalt you. Why? Because he wants to show you some things. Some things that require your focus to be undisturbed. You notice you won't get much from God as long as your focus is disturbed. As long as you can't focus very long until you're drawn away from other things, you won't get a lot from God. He wants an undisturbed focus, a gaze upon Him. And when that happens, well, God, speaking as a man, just can't help but divulge some of these treasures from His treasure house. Now today we're focusing on Types and shadows. Now, he's given us, this is quite a compelling text. Now, see, now, types and shadows are not just intended for men, although they're given to men. But they're not just for men. You, you got here, um, here um, he's, um, the apostle, remembering, speaking of the fellowship of the mystery, this is what he said now in Ephesians 3, 9. I'm, I'm bringing up this point that the types and shadows, even though they're given to men, they're not merely just for men. Okay, th 3 to 8, I'll read from 8. Unto me, who am blessed in the least of all saints, is this grace given? Is God, God's given Paul grace to do something, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. All right, he's going to bring us. He's given them something to bring them, bring them up. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. But from the beginning of the world has been hitting God who created all things by Christ Jesus to the intent. Now, he's going to bring men up, but there's an alter, alternate, ulterior motive here. God's doing something that requires men to be brought up to understand what his eternal purpose is. Why? To the intent, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. 
What is he doing? He's working in you, both the will and the do of his good pleasure, in order that principalities and powers and heavenly places might observe the wisdom. This wisdom of, look, you know how much wisdom it takes to save you? Oh, it takes God to do this. Only God can work salvation. Only God could even think of the way that he's done it. That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. How wise is that? God gave types and shadows to men in order that they may come to understand the reality that the type's pointing to in order that they might be transformed and speak forth these, these mysteries in order that the principalities and powers can observe it. Oh, look at this magnificent God. We knew you were great. We knew you had power. We saw you make the world. The angels, they shouted for joy when he made the world. Yes. They didn't see this kind of wisdom. This is a different type, different nature of wisdom. It's showing something about God Himself in salvation. Particularly today, we're going to look at mercy. Mercy plays a particular role. God doesn't save you because you needed saving. That isn't God's mercies at work. His mercies at work, and then we're going to see that He has protected it. He's got these cherubims. On both sides, yeah. that are beat out of the same piece, the same slab, beat right out of these beaten works, these cherubims. Oh. Amen. Notice how God's mercy is spoken of. It's spoken of like a seat. Look at this. This is a seat. Now you know the seat's for sitting on. Thou shalt make a mercy seat. Exodus 25, 17. Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cherubims and a half, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work. You're going to be involved in this part. You're going to be involved in this part. As, as God works in you, you're going to be involved in this cherubim work here. All right? God's, you don't touch the center part. Center part's a slab of gold. You don't lay your tool on that at all. But on the sides here, the demonstration of God's mercy... Well, this is going to affect angels here. Make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat, you shall make the cherubims of the two ends thereof. See how precise he is? He doesn't want anybody to ever get a wrong impression about this mercy seat. Ever. He doesn't want people to think that was two on one end and not one on the other end. He goes to great lengths to say, they're on both ends. Mercy is surrounded by these cherubs. They're looking on. And they're not just looking at themselves, although they're facing each other. But they're looking down. They're looking at the mercy. They stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat. Now that's an interesting word because that word covering could be protect. Could mean to defend the mercy. Could be to, 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 um, to, to enable. See, they, these, these, they've been given this. Their wings are covering Shadowing over. They shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. Now that's pretty specific. We don't have a lot of information concerning what cherubs are. If you've ever gone on in the scriptures and looked, tried to figure out what exactly are cherubs. Now I don't agree with the definition that says they're imaginary. And I don't believe that at all. I don't believe there's imaginary things in heaven. That's just silly. Well, we don't have a lot of information when it comes to scriptures that we can handle. Well, we need to handle what we have. The scripture gives us some, some things to work with. Here in Ezekiel 28, I'm talking about cherubs now. Remember, they were beaten to work on both sides of the, the mercy seat. So it behooves us to understand a little bit about these cherubs. What exactly are they? I don't know that you could ever come out of the scriptures and have an exact meaning about what they are, but let's just look at it. Ezekiel 28, thou art, talking about Lucifer now, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so, thou hast upon the holy mountains of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou hast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou hast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Talking about Lucifer now. So we know, right off the bat, that Lucifer was a cherub, an anointed cherub that covered I, do, isn't there any coincidence that he's talking about these cherubs and their wings come out and they cover? 
Okay, now, you know, I was thinking about this. This is a point of interest. We only have the names of few, just a couple of angels, right? Mm -hmm. Michael and Gabriel, right? Now, here when it talks about this cherub, this, the one that, this one that fell, because iniquity was found in him. All right, here in Isaiah 14, 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How? You, everything, everything was given unto you in order that you wouldn't fall. And yet, you fell. Why? Well, iniquity was found in him. See this? This is telling us something here. You think you're, you're really doing good? You probably are. But you got to keep yourself strong, see? Here you go. He's right in the presence of God. He fell right in the presence of God. This one did. You know, how can you possibly recover? There's no recover. No. They know nothing about God's mercy. He fell. And, and summarily, he was cast down to the earth. We'll, we'll see this. This is what he said. I will ascend up into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation, the sides north. I will ascend upon the heights of the clouds. Now, this is our enemy now we're talking about. This is our enemy. This is what his aspirations, when you're talking about God, his aspirations are to outdo him, to do something to be God. Now, there's no wonder now we have these two cherubs covering the mercy. There's no, he was a cherub. We're talking about a fallen cherub now. And he's out. He's out to destroy the works of God. Yeah. Now God's out to be merciful, to, to display his mercy. And he's got two cherubs that are protecting. Their, their wings are over this mercy. There's not anything he can do. Satan, the fallen cherub, can never stop God from being merciful. Amen. He can't do it, even though Amen. it says the archvillain now, this is the one, this is God's enemy, is the one that saw, he lifted himself up against God. So it would behooves us to, to see this more clearly. Now, this is what Peter said. Peter, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Isaiah, we're going to finish up. It says this is what is Satan's end is. You want to know the Satan's end? It's what it says. You had all these good aspirations? Well, good for him. He wanted to be better than God. This is what God says. Yet, yet, thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. In the end, this fallen cherub going to be cast to the sides of the pit. Any prominence, any, any, anything that he had, anything that he thought he possessed, going to be removed from him. God gave him a certain uh, dominion now. He's the prince of the power of the air, right? He's come, he's come up and he's actually making war against the saints. And everyone who has the testimony of Christ. But there's going to come a time when that dominion is going to be taken away from him. And he's going to be cast to the sides of the pit. Peter talks about it like this in 2 Peter 2.4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, see, he groups them all together. He just groups them all together and says, he said, the angels, he didn't spare the angels that sinned, but he cast them down to hell and delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. There's a sense in which Satan and all of his host can't learn a new thing about God. They can't. They're under chains of darkness. It behooves us to know this because see, this is our enemy. This is the one he's calculating against us. Because he's trying to get to God. He can't do anything. This, Lucifer can't do anything to hurt God. He can't. And yet, what does he do? He goes out. He makes war with, the, with those of the inhabitants of the earth, right? They have the testimony of Christ. Well, that's how Peter talks about him. Revelation 12, 7 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael... I like this view. This is a high exalted view. Michael and his angels. We're starting to see what an archangel is. Michael's an archangel. Remember when he contended with the body of Moses? Well, Michael, the archangel. He's over many angels. Uh, Michael and his angels, they, um, they fought against the dragon. And this dragon now, he's going to make it clear here, talking about Lucifer, about this fallen one, Satan. And the dragon fought and his angels. He's got some angels. This cherub, this fallen cherub, has got some angels under him. Well, we know by Revelation that a third of the, a third went with him. These were not the elect angels. These were not the holy angels. These are the fallen angels. And they fought with them, but they prevailed not. They're no match. They're, 
the fallen angels are no match for the holy angels. They're not. Because the holy angels, they come in the, the power of God. Yeah. <laughs> There's no match. When you really get down to it, if God hasn't, hadn't, hadn't, as it were, given a space of time, he'd already be in the bottomless pit. The devil would already be cast there. But see, God's doing something. Yeah. God's mercy's on display. Amen. And so for a time, see, it just, it just a space of time, God's given, given this fallen cherub an opportunity to, to want to try the saints. He's, try, he's trying. And um, God's used him for these kind of purposes. Some, some won't be able to stand the test of time. They'll be weeded out. God's weeding out all the, the defective ones, the, the, those who don't make their calling election sure. All right, so they made war. And they prevailed not, neither was there a place found anymore for heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. Now we're going to get some more information about him. That old serpent, the same one that was in the garden. We're seeing right here in Revelation chapter 12. The same one that tempted Eve, deceived her. Say the same one. It's, it's here in chapter 12. Why? Because he's, he hasn't changed at all. He has the same nature. He hates God just as much as he did right at the beginning. The same one. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, just so we know, get more precise here, is what the same one that fell, he's, he's still actively against the church. Still hates God just as much. Which deceived the whole world. He was cast into the earth, and his angels, his angels, were cast with him. Now see, we're, we're dealing, we're got, we've got an enemy. It's not just, it's not just the devil. we got this whole host of angels. Alright, he's out... Now, putting these scriptures together, and, and you look at stepping back and looking at the context. Now, we were talking about these cherubs on both sides of this mercy seat. And what are they? Putting these scriptures together gives a picture that cherubs, now they've been given to some sense, we could kind of derive at a, at a conclusion, they've been given some kind of authority. Satan, he was a cherub and he fell, but he, he drew a third of the stars with him. And it's like he, they, they make reference several times about them being his angels. Okay, so he's, he has his, his host, as it were, that God's allowed him to, to, for a short time, be over, be responsible for, provoking them to do certain things. And then you got God's angels now, his cherubs. You know this because it says, talking about his angels and the dragon fought with his angels. So, so the reference in this text to there being two cherubs, so being a cherub on each side of the mercy seat would imply that these are representatives of the whole angelic order here. These, these representatives, God put them here to, to, to represent something. It's a type. The angels, they desire to look into these things. Remember, I'm com commenting on the type of this. Now, Daniel talked about Michael being one of the chief princes. Remember in um, Daniel 10, 13. In Daniel 12, 1, Michael is said to be the great prince. Prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. So see, we got, we got Gabriel, we got Michael, and we've got Lucifer. These are the three angels that we, we have named in, in um, the scriptures. Remember, I'm commenting on the type now. When the tabernacle was constructed, he had Moses make this slab of gold that was called the mercy seat. And out of each, each end, they shaped the cherubs. And cherubs, they stretched their wings and they covered... Uh, you see, see why I've labored this point. Is that, look, he's given us a picture. You may have a fallen cherub out there that's against you, but look at what you got for you. Look at what you got for you, protecting. See, I just love this view. There's something more to be seen about cherubs in Ezekiel. Now, if you read from verse 1 in um, Ezekiel 10, you get the picture here, the context. I'm not going to because we're... We're kind of pressed for time, and it's a lot to read. But I just want to extract a couple of thoughts from this text, because this kind of shows you the cherubs aren't, aren't just, there's a sense of which they're messengers. But at the same time, these cherubs have been called to do something. These cherubs have the capacity, they understand what God sent them to do. There's some, to some degree, they've, they've got some... Um, so I'm leeway here. Now listen to this. Verse 12. I'll just pick up from verse 12. And their whole body, and their backs, and their hands, and their wings, and their wheels, their wheels now, were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they, they four had. Four of them were there. 
These cherubs are all about doing the will and the purpose of God. They're sent from the throne of God, from the presence of God. And they're all about doing what God purposed. They understand it. They, there isn't a part of them that isn't involved in this purpose. Remember he told, told Israel, don't, don't lie. Don't say it was an heir to the angel. Don't do it. Amen. See, they're, 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 they live in the presence of God. They, they live to do His will and only His will. And these are the ones now that are desiring to look into this mercy. These are the ones now that have spread their wings out over this mercy. And for the wheels... It was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel! Now a few times in the scripture speak of these wheels within wheels. You know, you, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Wheels within wheels. There's a purpose going on. You may only behold this part of it, but that's not the extent of it. That's just the part you can see. There's wheels. There's things going on. God's eternal purpose is, 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 is going on. From the time He started, created the world, His eternal purpose has been rolling over everything that's contrary to it. God's working a purpose. There's wheels within wheels. And these cherubs, they've been brought into this. They, they, they don't go any place except it has to do with this purpose. They've been employed by God to do His will. See, God's revealing here that there's, in this mercy, there's these cherubs that are involved. It's not as that quite that easy for you to get mercy. There's things involved with you getting this mercy. There's wheels within wheels. These cherubs are a part of it. Aren't they all ministering spirits? Sent forth the minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. You think he just got mercy by accident? No, no. This, they, God's, God's working salvation in the midst of the earth. And he's used, God uses resources. God just doesn't have angels and cherubs standing around just so they can make heaven look pretty. They're doing something. There's wheels within wheels. It appears that these angelic creatures have been given a certain amount of authority over this grace. See, they're working all these things according to His will. And every one of them, everyone, had four faces. I thought... This was quite, quite telling here. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man. And the third face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an, angel, an eagle. Now these personalities, they're very versatile. God sends them on a mission. They're absolutely equipped to do the thing that God sent them to do. Now you're going to harden your heart against God. You're going to hate God. You know, I'll tell you what you're going to get. Exactly what God said. You're going to get the wrath of God. And it's going to be poured out. And it's going to happen. But if you love God, he can, keep, he can keep mercy. He'll do it. He'll keep mercy for thousands. Because they love him. That's why. Because they love him. Amen. Wheels within wheels. The personalities are versatile. They're equipped. He sends them to do something and they're instant in it. See, they don't have to, to go and pray about this thing. They're instant in it. Why? Because they've been sent from God. They're his. They do his will. And the cherubs... We're lifted up. He said, this is the living creature that I saw by the river of Tebar. And when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. That's kind of interesting. They didn't go anywhere on their own. They went according to His will, according to His divine providence. They went to do what He told them to do. And when the cherubs lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. No, you know, there isn't any place that these cherubs go or do that isn't in connection with this eternal purpose of God. Everywhere these cherubs go, everything they do, it's connected, precisely in our text, it's connected with the mercy of God. God's working mercy in the midst of the earth, and look, He's employed all of the personalities in heaven. Why do they desire to look in this? Because in one place it says they're our fellow brother. Now that doesn't mean they're men. doesn't mean they're going to turn into men. It means they've, God's employed them in salvation. Okay, they, they, they're ministering spirits. They minister you. No wonder there's joy in heaven when one repents. Their ministry just got bigger. Now, it should not surprise us. We see that these cherubs, they're, they're used by God. They're given a certain, a, a, they're equipped to do certain things. And they're used. Now, Shouldn't surprise us that God has set two of these personalities when it has to do with this mercy. It shouldn't surprise us. God wants us to know He's in charge of mercy. He's in charge of it. He's given, 
He's given control over this. No one, in other words, no one's going to get mercy that doesn't deserve mercy from one standpoint. Another standpoint, no one's going to get mercy that God doesn't will to get mercy. It's not going to happen. You can't, see, men may, might be able to fool other men, but you can't fool God when it comes to your heart. When it comes to your heart, if you, if you turn away from your ways and you repent and you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, this mercy will be yours. He'll give it to you. Why? Because this is God's nature. God doesn't have, God's not trying to be merciful. God is merciful. It's what He is. He's gracious. But He will, but will by no means clear the guilty. You just make a profession and have no heart for God. This, this mercy is not for you. You're not going to get this mercy. It's like locked up. There's cherubs that are keeping watch on it. Remember, we talked, the first, the first incidence of cherubs is right there in the garden, remember? Adam had to leave, and he set a cherub there with a flaming sword to keep the way of the tree of life. No one got to that tree. They had to deal with this cherub first. It's the same way with this mercy. No one's going to get it. No one's going to, except for the authorized ones, the ones who have the mark of God, as it were. God's conforming His people and revealing that when it comes to the mercy of God, there's no possible way that His purpose isn't going to be accomplished. Now, it says God takes this personally. See, God personally saves every single person that's saved. You don't come in as a group. You come in as one by one. Yeah. See, God's very specific about this. He gives you a new heart. He, he, you, you, have a, you have a new man, you, you have new desires, you have new... Why? Because you've partaken of this mercy. This mercy, it's become yours. When the cherubs shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another towards the mercy, shall the faces of the cherubs be... Now, the, there's wheels to wheels when it comes to this mercy. You can't see it all. You can, you know, you know when you come in, you know one thing. You know that... I was dead, and now I'm alive. I was a sinner, and he saved me. What happened? You became a partaker of this mercy. There's a sense in which, see, this, this, this ultimate purpose, now it's to conform you into the image of a son. You're not conformed yet, but this mercy will do it. This mercy will conform you. See, it'll keep you coming. It'll keep you looking at the face of God. Now, the specific information was given concerning the mercy seat, where it was. You can't put the mercy seat under the tabernacle. It's got to be on top. It's got to be on top. Everything that passes, the testimony has to, be, has to be filtered through the mercy. Talking about for the angels' sake now. The angels are looking into this stuff, and without mercy, there'd be no reason for God to save anybody. Yeah. If he wasn't a merciful God, there'd be no salvation. There would be no reason for him to save you. But God, see, he's exhibiting this mercy. Now, um, it's no... It's no um, accident that, remember, the apostle in Hebrews 10, 12, he makes a point about this, this one that would go and sit down. This man, he's talking about Christ now, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God. It's no wonder he gave us a type of a mercy seat. This one was going to take away sin. He was going to go sit down on the throne of grace and he was going to administer this kingdom. He was going to start taking this grace, this mercy, and giving it to the people. Why? Because sins were put away now. Many times there's, there's a reference is made to, remember God said, this is where I'll meet with you. This right in between the cherubs, above the mercy seat. That's where I'll meet with you. There, I'll meet with you. I'll commune with thee from above the mercy seat. So this is, this is God's favored place to meet with men. It's above the mercy seat. In the context of, of um, His eternal purpose. There, I'll meet with you. That's a good place to meet with God. Amen. It's a good place to meet with God. Mercy is not something that God might be. Merciful is something He is. And it isn't, it's not no coincidence that that's exactly what you need. And it isn't like you needed it back in 1970, but you don't need it today. This is every day. Sufficient unto the days, the evil thereof. You need your, your daily dose of mercy. Mercy. 
The contrast between God's mercy and His wrath needs to be seen in this present time. I know people who, who they talk about God's mercy as long as it means I can sin and do whatever I want and God won't hold it against me. That's not what mercy is. That's, see, this is surely as God is mercy, merciful, He's also just and He's holy. All these things are combined. See, they've, they've kissed each other in Christ Jesus. He's taken away sin Amen. to where God can be merciful. Amen. But see, for someone who presumes on God's mercy and stays in sin, he will by no means clear the guilty. Amen. He puts that in there for us. Why? Because we need it. We're in we're a time right now when we're being tempted on all sides, even in our own flesh. Our own flesh will say, sit down and take a break. You've worked really hard today. See, your new man's got to rise up and say, I will not. I'm not going to rest on yesterday's mercy. I'm going to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because His mercy is new every day. I need it. If you want to receive a favorable response from God, you've got to get out of the category of, of guilty. You got to. You can't be guilty and get something from God. Now Christ is there. He's a propitiation. We're talking about the seat of propitiation. Christ is sitting there. What's he doing? He's bringing many sons to glory. How's he doing it? He's, he's, he's got resources. He's got all things pertaining to life, to life and godliness. He's got salvation. He's, he's purchased it with his own blood. So see now, all, what does it take? Well, a good and an honest heart. How do you get that? Well, God will give it to you. He, he, he will give it to you. Do you want it? See, the, this, I can remember when this impacted my life more than anything else. Do you want to be close to God? Because if you do, you can. Amen. Iniquity. Amen. Visiting the iniquity. Uh, I, this is not something that people even believe that God can do. There's something that people have written this off. Wait a minute, God won't do that anymore. God doesn't visit the iniquity. Well, he says he visits the iniquity upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. That's what he said. The iniquity of the fathers. Now, I tell you, as far as the generational curse goes, if you're in the flesh, you definitely got a problem with the generational curse. And it goes all the way back to Adam. It goes all the way back to Adam. You inherited something that you didn't really want to. But you inherited it nonetheless. You're born under trouble as the sparks fly upward. You've been born with a nature that's against God. Every man's got to be saved. All right? So there's a sense, see, that now look at this. This is the way God is. And He is this way. He's declared it. It's not, we're not making this up. We're not pretending. This is the way God is. He'll visit the iniquity. Now, you got to get out of that category. You got to get into Christ and out of Adam, and now you're free from this. This is the way you, you escape upward. You, you get into Christ. Well, if God's this way, and He is, He'll visit the iniquity on them that hate Him. That's what it says, them that hate Him. He'll visit the Well, how much more? How much more will, will He have compassion and grace and mercy on them that love Him? Will it just be to the third and fourth generation? Could it be that I'm experiencing mercy and grace because Christ died? Yes, I do believe that's it. I do believe that's it. I believe He died. He took away sin. And now because He did that, I can have mercy from God. Now see, that's not visiting the iniquity. That's visiting the righteousness, isn't it? Consider this. If God has set up a throne of grace, if He's revealed to these types and these shadows that He sits on a mercy seat, then which, God of, which part of God's nature is He highlighting in salvation? It's not the destruction. He could, show, he could destroy the whole world in a flood. What's He doing in salvation? He's saving people. He's taking people that were lost, and He's bringing them close to God. Now, this is an impossibility in the flesh. We all know this. You come close to God, you'll be consumed. He's a, he's a consuming fire. But you get into Christ Jesus, and it's like you're fireproof. You can come close to God. Come close to God. If God will visit the iniquity on future generations and hate him, that hate Him, imagine how much more He's inclined to fulfill the showing mercy unto thousands. See, that sounds like God, doesn't it? Yeah. Showing mercy unto thousands. Yeah, you know how much bigger that is? This is God. It's our God. Amen. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. 
The question is, is do you love him? See, the contrast is there, that basically when you get right down to it, there's some people that hate God. And there's some people that love him. God's going to give mercy to those that love him. And he's going to give wrath Unto those who hate him. So now, we, we can all judge ourselves. See, this is something that we can do every day. Do I love God? Okay, now something comes up now. God, on purpose, this is going to happen. Something's going to come up that's going to test. Do you love God? Because I know that if I love my wife, that I'll go to work. And I'll give her the benefits from my labors. Why? Because I love her. And I prepare a, a way for her. Why? I don't have, to have an answer. Why? I love her. If you love God, nothing's going to be able to turn you away from Him. Nothing! And if there is something, now we got some work to do. God's using these types of shadows to help men be able to come to the knowledge of who He is. Now, it is true that before you're going to be in a good example to the angels, you're going to have to see it for yourself. You're going to have to taste that the Lord is good. The Lord's gracious. And when you do... See, when the, when the angels see you and see a testimony of God's mercy, now they desire to look into that. They desire, it, look at what it's done in this person's life. He was lost. I witnessed him. But now look what he's doing now. He's made progress in the Lord. Now they know it's not by works of righteousness that you've done. They, they know it. We, 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 we struggle with it. But they know it. They, they, they look, they know. They can see the new man and they can see what's going on in you. Why? Because their ministering spirits send forth the minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. They saw the moment that Christ came in you. They've been ministering to you ever since. Thank God it's been in the background, but they've been doing it. They've, they've been faithful with their end of the, of, the, of the project. God's using these, these types and shadows to show them. See, the... When they see Christ in you, oh, I'm telling you, they rejoice. They rejoice. They're, they don't miss it. When you know what God is like in, 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 in the, this Scripture, and the Scriptures are full of these comparisons, and you know what God is like, you see the Bible completely different. The Scriptures take on a whole new light when you see God's merciful. He's a merciful God. He's long-suffering. You can see it everywhere. Of course, because it is everywhere. See, God just didn't start after Jesus died being merciful. He was merciful. Christ would have never died. There's many, many examples, which we don't have a lot of time to go into them all right now. But um, I'll, just, I'll just mention the headings to you. All right. You got the plagues of Egypt. Throughout the whole plagues of Egypt, what does God do? He's, he said, I'm going to make a distinction. This is what God said. I'm going to make a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. So what does he do? He judges the Egyptians' gods, absolutely decimates the land, and then in the end, kills all the firstborn, but not one of the Israelites. He's not one. What was God doing? He was showing, I'm going to show mercy to them that love me, Amen. and I'm going, to, I'm going to show wrath to them that hate me. So that, that whole episode, I mean, that could be a series of sermons right there, but that whole episode, God was showing something, a distinction. Why? Because there is a distinction to be seen. And how about the Exodus? The day of the Exodus, when they crossed the Red Sea. What did God do there? God showed a distinction. You got, you got the same waters that were, that were a safety to the Israelites crossing. The same wall of water turned out to be the grave of the Egyptians. Why? They said, what they say? I will pursue. I will overtake. Yeah, I will divide the spoil. Well, they just forgot something. When they got in the middle, they remembered it. God's fighting for these. God's fighting for these Israelites. God loves them. And it became very evident that God hates us. And they all died, every one of them. God did these things that, it's what it says, that Israel might know. Israel might know and understand his ways. That's what he said. They're on the other side of the river now. The, the seas all killed them all and they're washing up on the shore. What do they do? They sing a song to God. Yes. They believed that day. Believe me. But see, this, this deliverance, it wasn't random. God was, God was showing something. He was showing the distinction that this is a part of His nature. He loves them. He loves Him. 
and he hates them that hates him. Now, God's given this example many times over and over in Scripture. And if you have the eyes to see it now, because I know you do, but you go all the way back, you got this conflict between Abel and Cain. See, right from the beginning, God's showing us this thing. You got Noah and the whole rest of the world. All right, you got Jacob and Esau. God shows a very distinct picture there. You got Daniel, and how about those who had Daniel cast into the pit? Well, in the end, Daniel was standing on top, and they were in the pit being eaten by the lions. Well, God was showing the distinction. All right, you got David and Saul. You got two kings, both of them chosen by God, but not both of them. Both of them didn't get the same, the same from God, did they? You got Peter and Judas, both of them. All right, now both of them, they had to deal with what they needed to repent, right? Both of them did something they needed to repent of. All right, in the end, what do you got? You got, you got um, um, Peter that repented and just with a look. He just looked at him and he just, he repented he was sorry. You got Judas who repented himself. In other words, he was sorry he got caught and then went and hung himself. Well, what is that? That's a distinction. God's showing you something. Amen. Those who, remember who those who sold a plot of ground and gave the money. They really did it. They sold the land and they brought the money and they laid it at the apostles' feet. And this was accepted by the Lord. Then you got Ananias and Sapphira who appeared on the surface to do the same thing. And yet he said, why have you lied? Why, have you, why would you possibly want to lie to the Holy Spirit? They fell down dead. What was that? God was showing the distinction. Now, ultimately, the ultimate comparison, and I'll close with this, is this distinction that we have in Christ. See, whether or not people want to admit it or not, the cross of Christ is going to determine whether or not they're saved or not. How do you feel about the cross of Christ? How do you feel about Christ? Is His cross a stumbling stone? A rock of offense? When somebody tells you you need to lay down your life so that you can have life with Christ, is that offensive to you? Do you think you shouldn't be so judgmental? You shouldn't be so judgmental. I'm doing the best I can. Jesus says, unless a man take up his cross and follow after me, he cannot be my disciple. You see the distinction? Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. Why? Because you see, he's the one. He's the one that's taken you out of the pit, out of the mire, and set your feet on a rock. He's the one that's caused you to be able to revenge your disobedience. He's the one that's helped you to, to be able to know God and see these riches and glory. He, so when you look at Christ, He's precious. He's precious. But what about those who He's not precious? That's what it says. Kiss the Son. I highly recommend this. Amen. Kiss the sun lest he be angry and you perish from the way. And all going to come down to on the day of judgment, what did you think about Jesus? And see, this will impact every moment of everyone's life. What do you think about Jesus? Do you think him worthy of your whole life? Or maybe just a little bit? Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but... Unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same one now is made the head of the corner, the stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, which also they were appointed. Whereunto they were appointed. So see, this whole thing is going to come down to, what did you think of Christ? Whose son is he? The, the thing is, is that all these things are stepping stones to see where you're at with, where, where are you really at with God? Well, if you love Him, if you love Him and you love His appearance, you know that. This isn't something you're guessing about. You know it and, um, and His appearance is not, not something you want to draw back from. You actually long for it. You find yourself, you ever found yourself longing? Longing. I can't wait till He comes and I can look. Is this our God? We waited for Him. Now see, this, you can have great confidence. You have great confidence if this is really from the heart. You want Him to come and take away all this. Well, you're going to be with Him. See, that's a great incentive to be with the Lord. Well, thank you, brethren. I, sorry about the coat.